Welcome to our discussion on double angle and half angle formulas. As with uh, most of the videos in, in this particular sec, uh, section of videos, it's just a whole slew of angles, uh, sorry, a whole slew of formulas that you either memorize, if need be, and I, I would not memorize it unless you absolutely have to, um, or you just compile a big list and you just keep them handy and whenever you see something that looks like it might use a certain type of formula you use that type of formula. It's all going to come down to kind of recognizing how these formulas can help you. So just like before fast forward to the particular part you want to review but it all comes down to these formulas. Right? Before we had sine, cosine, and tangent of sums and differences. Something plus something, something minus something. Now we have sine, cosine, and tangent of 2 times something. So it could still be the same case as uh, a u plus v, where u and v are the same, right? Or it could just be 2x. So you can see there is a little overlap with at least the sum uh, formulas. Okay, so you would recognize when to use double angle formulas whenever you're trying to compute or solve for or deal with or work with sine, cosine, and tangent of a double angle, a 2x, a 2 times something. Then you have these power reducing formulas. Whenever you have sine squared, cosine squared, and tangent squared, but they're kind of by themselves, right? When, if we have a sine squared plus a cosine squared, we know that's just 1. So if we have sine squared and cosine squared together, then maybe we can manipulate them around and use the Pythagorean identities. If we have tangent squared plus secant squared, we can maybe manipulate those around and, and you know use Pythagorean theorems. But if we just have one of these, sine, cosine, or tangent squared, just hanging around, then it might be easier to reduce the power, use the power reducing formulas and get them down to linear terms, right? A, a, a cosine or a sine. In, these, in this case, they start off with all cosines and then you can manipulate them from there using the double angle formulas, right? Um, and then, in addition to the double angle formulas, you have half angle formulas. So you recognize those whenever you have a theta divided by 2. Don't know why all of a sudden they change the theta. It could be the same thing if it was x divided by 2, right? Um, and, that, and that's pretty much it. We're going to go through a couple examples, but the bottom line is just some more formulas to stick uh, on a list with all of your other formulas. And what you really need to be practicing is how to recognize when to use each formula. It does no good to, to practice a bunch of homework problems and use these formulas over and over again without thinking about, well, how did I know to use this formula for that question? because the homework told me to? Okay, well that's kind of a, a cheat. Maybe the, the homework tells you for the next five questions use the double angle formulas. But instead you want to just look at those questions and go how could I look at that question on a test and recognize it as needing to use a double angle formula? Or how could I look at this question on a test and recognize that it's a, a sum formula or a difference formula or I would use power reducing. You get my point? That's what you want to be practicing with these. Okay, let's start with the double angle formulas. There they are, right? Good luck memorizing them. Here's some examples. Sine of 2 theta, cosine of 2 theta, tangent of 2 theta. We can swap them out, make them in terms of a theta. Why would we want to do that? Well, because we're given what cosine of theta is. And because we know what cosine of theta is, we know what sine of theta is and tangent of theta is. If you don't remember that, that comes from our right triangle trigonometry. Here's my right triangle. Here's my theta. They tell me cosine of theta equals negative 3 fifths. Sokotoa, right, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle. Because it's negative, and theta is in quadrant 2, right? So we're over here in quadrant 2, which gives me a negative x value, but it also now tells me my sine values are positive, and then it of course tells me everything else. I'll know that tangent's negative, sine is positive. Um, and then, once I use these double angle formulas, 
I can get everything written in terms of just cosines you know, of a single theta. In this case, it's cosine squared. Uh, my tangent theta is sine over cosine, which we can figure out from here, or we can just figure it out from the triangle. Right? Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So when we do the double angle formula with sine, we plug in what sine and cosine are. When we do the double angle formula for cosine, we plug in cosine and sine. When we do the double angle formula for tangent, we just plug in tangent and tangent. Now, with all these examples, you know, with this first slide, they're showing you how to find these um, these other sine and tangent things using Pythagorean identities and the identity of a tangent. That's all well and good, but we can also do it with a triangle. Just remember, there's normally more than one way to kind of tackle these trig stuff. Okay, so those are those double angle examples. How about a triple angle formula for sine? We've got sine of 3x. Well, we can immediately break that up into 2x plus x. The 2x part is going to use our double angle formula, and the x part is just going to be by itself. Now, where did all of this junk come from? How did, how did we get from here to all of this? Well, that's from our um, sum, right? our, our sum formula, right? So using our uh, sum formula, sine cos minus cos sine, we get sine of 2x cosine of x minus cosine of 2x sine of 2x. And I know this looks like it's supposed to be squared, but that's just a typo. It's supposed to be uh, down here. That's just cosine of 2x. And then we use the double angle formula on cosine and sine. So here's sine of 2x. Here's cosine of 2x. And the rest just becomes some pretty simple algebra, right? 2 sine cos cos gives me 2 sine cos squared. Right? Plus sine times this, we just distribute it through, and we get sine and then minus 2 sine cubed. See that? Okay, cosine squared becomes 1 minus sine squared. And then when we combine those, when we distribute through, we get 2 sine x minus 2 sine cubed x, right? Plus sine x minus 2 sine. We put the 2 sine cubes together, which gives us 4 of those. And then we put the single sine with the other single sine, and we have 3 of those. And we've now identified that sine of 3x equals 3 sine x minus 4 sine cubed x. You might be thinking, how in the heck am I going to know how to do all this? Well, you don't. You just know that, you know, I'm trying to get a triple angle on one side, and on the other side, I want just sines of x's. You see how you recognize it's a sine of x here, and it's a sine of x here. Granted, it's a sine cubed, but it's still a sine of x. Okay, so that's telling me I better use these double angle and sum of angle formulas so that I can basically tear this 3 out of there because I just need sine of x because using the double formula, right, the double angle formula is going to give me things in terms of just x, sine x cosine x. Using the sum formula, again, just keeps things singular. But now we've introduced these cosines into the mix and we know our final answer doesn't have cosines in it. So once we distribute some stuff, and we get down to this point, we're thinking, oh, well, this is a cosine. I don't want, you know, I want nothing but sines. So that's why you would think about doing your trig, uh, your Pythagorean identity switch here to get rid of the cosine and bring in the sines. And now we got something all in terms of sines. And then it's just clean it up and get it to look like what it's supposed to look like. Okay, so those are the kind of the, the clues, the signposts that get you where you need to go. How about power reducing? We can use power reducing to write cosine of the fourth that only uses first powers of cosines um, of multiple angles. So we want cosine of the fourth to be lit, written in just cosine of some stuff, right? Not cosine squared, not cosine cubed. First things first, we know that our power reducing formulas only work for squares. So we rewrite this as a square of a square. Then we do our um, substitution. 
and now cosine squared becomes 1 plus cosine 2x over 2. That thing is still squared. So go ahead and square it. All right. Here all we did was we pulled out the 4 on the bottom. Right. We factored out a 1 fourth just to make this piece look easier and simpler and figure out what we're doing. Because now all of this is good. This is the only bad piece because that's still squared. Okay. So what do we do here? We just replaced it. Remember that the original one, if you don't remember, there it is, it's cosine squared of 2x. We had cosine squared of 2x, right? And the reduction formula is that if we have cosine squared of x, it's going to equal 1 plus cosine of 2x all over 2. So if I have cosine squared of p, isn't that just going to equal 1 plus cosine of 2p over 2? And if that p just equals 2x, then you just put 2x in for p here, and 2 times 2x gives me 4x. That's where that comes from. Now all they're doing here is distributing the half, right? 1 divided by 2 plus 1 half times this to kind of clean things up because then we can add like terms we can put our constants together and then we're left with this stuff here again we can add our constants and we can't add cosine 2x and cosine 4x because those are two different things and there we have it all in terms of linear cosines right they're not raised to any power it's okay that they're cosine of 2x and 4x because it told us that was fine, it just didn't want any powers. Half angle formulas, there they are again. How about an example here? Because we know this, that 157.5 is 315, right, divided by 2, we can use the half angle formula. And the only reason why we recognize that is because we know 315 is a special angle, right? What is 315? It's all the way around over here where 360 minus 315 leaves us with 45. Aha! That's the reference angle of 45. And we know the 45 degree angles. Those are nice because we know cosine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2 and sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. So down here we would just have cosine of square root of 2 over 2, but sine would be negative square root of 2 over 2. By doing the half angle formula, we now get cosine written in terms of that 315, which is square root of 2 over 2, right? There's our swapping that in with the thing that we know, doing a little simple algebra, and our final answer looks very ugly because we have a square root of a square root. That is actually a real thing. You can't have a square root of a square root. And, and that's what you that's how you would have to write it if you wanted to write it um, accurately, right? Otherwise you'd have to type all that in your calculator and then you would have some approximation with a decimal. So this is the only way to write it out as an accurate number. Last but not least, we can solve some equations. And this is really what all this is boiling down to. All of these identities that we're learning in all of these videos, in these later videos with the trig stuff, is also we can take an equation and manipulate it. Uh, move stuff around so that we can solve for it. Here we're solving for zeros, right? Very important thing, finding all the zeros of something. Here we want to find all solutions in a certain interval where it equals zero. Again, very important to find zeros. Um, we don't know how to deal with x over 2, so we can use uh, half angle formulas or because sine is x, we can rewrite it as an x over 2 using the half angle formulas so we can get them all as half angles and then be able to combine some things and then factor some things out and once it's factored then we can set it equal to 0 and know each factor is set equal to 0 and that's the big thing is being able to get factors. So now we know that equals 0 or that equals 0 and that's a very simple thing to solve because we know uh, when cosine equals 0 it's at pi over 2 in the interval they gave us so we just set x over 2 equal to that and solve for x, pi, very simply. Do the same thing with the other piece. 
set that equal to 0, move the 1 over, divide by 2, now all of a sudden it equals 1 half, we know where sine equals 1 half, it's pi over 6, or it's at 5 pi over 6, because those are the only two that are in the interval they gave us, we set each of those equal to the x over 2 and solve. Okay, so it's all, you know, coming down to being able to set things equal to zero and solve. That's going to be some of the big things that we need to do in, in calculus and physics and other classes. In summary, there's our formulas. More and more in formulas to just make everybody hate trig that much more. But hopefully you don't have a professor that requires you to memorize. They'll let you have notes on a test or something. Um, if you do need to memorize them, uh, good luck. My hat's off to you for trying, um, and my pity to you if you're forced to. Hopefully you can just have a sheet of formulas and just recognize when to use them.